for different uh, families and different practical activities. In this area, um, it remains uh, particularly well preserved because this area, this part of, of Yucatan Peninsula was largely not in use for several centuries. So from 1600, there were very few people moving around here. As archaeological evidence, as we call it, as archaeologists, is very well preserved. And it demonstrates now through the leader images an extremely complex and intense use of this landscape. Um, all corners of it in this part of, of the Yucatan Peninsula was in use in some way or another. And that is extremely intriguing and interesting for us. This is how these remains look at a uh, close up uh, today. Uh, we do not, if you are not an archeologist, you cannot see what it is. In Cancun, we have all these hotels that is the tourist world of Cancun, what is famous in the world, the tourist section of, of Cancun. But this is the Cancun from the 1960s when it was founded. The 1960s is a recent city. This was what was considered and what was thought to be become the center of Cancun. It is a small planned area. There are many new areas emerging with little planning. A large part of the population lives like this. This is a typical traditional Maya dwelling, and it is where a lot of people live, even many of those who work at the big hotels. And some people live in these very precarious uh, buildings of another character. So Cancun is multifaceted. It contains different layers of different traditions. It contains different time entities. Uh, and uh, this is what is Cancun, even if most people only think about the hotels. So starting there, that recognizing that this is actually the world, we start thinking about how we could address and how we can think new projects in this world. And of course, we must start recognizing that the socioeconomic and the political conditions are important. They, they pose actual limits to our practice and to our mind. But we should not accept that, not take that as a sort of eternal thing. And to introducing the notion of time in our minds in the broadest sense, we see new possibilities and stop relying only on what is immediately available. We think that a truly human built environment is that which is multiple and represent indirectly various regulating principles, though it is orchestrated in a productive and aesthetic way. So our general sources of inspiration comes from many types of thoughts about social practice, the impossibility of closing a particular cultural set, absolutely, and a certain idea of a wide human horizon. We are inspired by Derrida, De Beauvoir, Sartre, and even certain ideas from Badiou. But we will not use these in a dogmatic fashion, but rather with a lack of respect. Further, we add to this the dimension of, of the aesthetic. We think that there was a serious flow when Claude, in argument, when Durkheim and Mars, these famous French sociologists, suggested at the beginning of the 20th century, that a built environment necessarily represent the whole of a given society. This has been a very common way of thinking. This is not to say that we question that point of departure. This is not to say that there are no links between built environment and society. There are such links, but they are neither simple or straightforward. The same built skeleton of a building may well be used used for different functions and have different social associations over time. Stockholm in Sweden, the capital of Sweden has its famous old town. Um, there are buildings mostly from the 16th century. Some are even older, built in stone. Uh, just to take two examples from time, 
in the 1920s, it was considered a slum area with poor people almost marginalized in society. Today, it is an area in which the elite reside. The buildings as skeletons are the same. The streets run in the same way as they did in the 1920s, but the function and the social meaning of the old town of Stockholm is a completely different one. To see these differences, we must look at the details and the empirical. Of course, the details are extremely important. I think that Alessandro Camus' interesting example the other day about how doing some small windows in an old building, a small Italian mountainside, may be of enormous importance for how this building works. That is a good example for how we transfer new ideas into an existing built environment and just change it completely. For us, in terms of analytical units and as units of primary interest, the landscape section is our point of departure for each project. Never an individual building or only a set of buildings. The built environment in its general natural environment, if you call it so, is at the core of the issue. Of course, these entities are just analytical entities. We do know that they are part of wider context and we must take that into consideration. Not even a specific mega city like Mexico City or Istanbul can be grasped without reference to wider worlds. So these connections, geographical and temperature perspectives, means that there is no absolute idea how settlement patterns work and operate in given context. So we must look also outside the particular landscape section for inspiration. The documentation of built environments are crucial because through that we have a better possibility to be inspired by different kinds of built environments. So the process that we see now in the work of Tuariani, who has done a lot of documentation of built environments, is at the utmost important for the future of built environment. Instead of considering management to be the general orchestrating entity in a project, it should be the aesthetics. The aesthetics orchestrate the functional. The aesthetics but in the small and above all in the general organization of a landscape section is the key. And at this point, we are inspired by authors like Le Corbusier, Leo Adler, Charlotte Bieler, Friedrich Antal, Le Militiz. The interesting journal, Sachspiece für Ästhetik und Allgemeine Kunstwissenschaft, which was published in Germany until the Nazi takeover, does have an enormous lot of interesting ideas. The difference in perspective is overwhelming. It's a rich source for inspiration. It's available today digitally. I do highly recommend you to look at that. I will not go into all these authors. I will not do, uh, we will not do a, a sort of general discussion of all these authors at this occasion. We will do that at some other point. We have a lot of critical arguments and discussions of different authors, but that will appear at another occasion. Fantasy within a logical framework is basic and very important. Not fantasy in the repeated way, not uh, what is commonly called today uh, fantasy, uh, but uh, in terms of something that is really new. And the digital today, the possibilities of fast traveling are factors to take into consideration. They can be seen as contradictions because the digital gave us the possibility to sit at different spaces as we do today, largely, and communicate and do things together. The fast traveling make it possible for us to travel worldwide relatively fast. Both these factors are extremely important to take into consideration. The project to operate, of course, within a general democratic framework, general rule of law, and should be inclusive. The market should not be the only operative function. 
Uh, and specialization is very important in society. You must understand that. But if different fields of specialization cease to communicate, they will not give great contributions. Thus, it is important to enhance collaboration and to educate ourselves a little bit in the various fields in order to produce productive collaboration. In a particular work on a landscape section, we must look at topographic climate vegetation, as well as thinking about the strong forces of nature, like, for example, earthquakes, volcanoes, which are factors of utmost importance. And the existing conditions in terms of topographic climate and vegetation should not necessarily be looked at as problems. In Sweden, we have seen many projects thinking like that. If there are some rocks at a spot, they must be taken away to level the ground. We think that the rock could be a major human value and become interesting aesthetical environments in the future. Pre-existing human built environment should also be considered a possibility, not necessarily considered an obstacle. This is not always correct to preserve an existing built environment, but the possible values of preservation should be carefully evaluated and it could well be integrated into something new. In the evaluation of previous built environment as a special location, it is necessary to look not only what we see, but we should also look below ground. In looking at below ground, archaeology would be one of the methods. Parts of a built environment should be constructed with the thought of it being having a possibility of durability. Was the building process as such, including all its parts, and the demolition process are highly destructive often for the environment. Other parts of the built environment could be constructed with very simple materials, which are not highly damaging. So that was my brief presentation today. Uh, I would like to say that I think that uh, an event such as this uh, at uh, the in Istanbul, in this case, the ACCP meetings are not just ceremonial events, but we should think about them as productive and inspiring events for the future of our built environment. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Aisho Jam, I think you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, per, uh, Elas Karnal. I also agree with you. Uh, the symposium should be productive and very important for us to discuss uh, our ideas. So uh, I have to remind you uh, that uh, we will have all the questions at the end of the section. Now we will continue with uh, Zeynep Önsel Atala. Uh, can I have... Her, yeah, uh, Zeynep is a PhD candidate uh, of Istanbul Technical University, Faculty of Architecture. She has uh, also, uh, she had a dissertation uh, and also uh, she is, uh, she studied as a, I'm sorry, I can't read it. She is uh, well, assistant between uh, 2012 and 2018 in Technical University. She uh, spent some time in also University of Stuttgart, a urban design institute as a scholar and visiting researcher. She has, uh, she is also a member of ECOMOS Turkey National Committee, the Komomo Turkey and Chamber of Architects of Turkey. So let's have uh, Zeran uh, Ersel Atala for her presentation. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Today, uh, sorry for that. Today, uh, I will give a speech on the conservation planning challenges of a multi layered Western Anatolian city, Afyon. Uh, this paper shows the, also the results of a section of the ongoing PhD thesis 
under the supervision of Yıldız Salman at Istanbul Technical University. Uh, the speech will have an introduction, very introduction uh, part, and I will briefly tell you about the location and the historic background of the uh, city of Afyon. Uh, then I will continue with the uh, urban development and planning activities uh, that are have been doing uh, for the city of Afyon. Uh, then I will tell you about the conservation planning activities, the current conservation issues related to those activities and the uh, conclusion remarks. So Afyon is a city located in the Western Anatolia, Turkey. Uh, the province, which is the one of the 81 provinces of Turkey is located in the western middle of the Anatolian Peninsula and in the inner part of the Aegean region. The city is in the mountainous countryside inland from the Aegean coast and the name Karahisar, uh, since there is a castle on the black rock. Here you can see the black rock and on top of this hill, there is a castle located. The current population of the city center is almost 300,000 inhabitants. Afyon, which is shaped as a castle city, is also an important connection center. The Izmir railway line passed through the city uh, in 1896 and the Istanbul railway line in 1897. So both lines were joined in Afyon. The urban planning activities in the early Republican years in Turkey follow the basis created by topographical engineers who prepared city maps at the end of 19th century in Ottoman Empire. Here you can see a city map drawn by a military officer in 1906 for Afyon. These planning studies were primarily experienced on areas mostly affected by fires with the general attitude of creating a grid system and widening streets. The fires that took place in the city of Afyon in the 19th century in 1826, 1874 and 1890 respectively caused destruction in the built environment. And after the fire of 1890, the entire here you can see the Taj Mahal, uh, Taj Ahmed district, sorry, was rebuilt. And after the railway line reached the city in 1897, the Hamidiye and Mejidiye neighborhoods were established on both sides of the road connected to Izmir station. And these neighborhoods are the first urban arrangements that diverge from the organic urban fabric with their wide roads perpendicular to each other. In the 20th century, uh, the new neighborhoods, railway and administrative centers uh, formed in the city are the components of the modernization that started in the Ottoman period. And here you can see the main station boulevard of Afyon, the old station boulevard in 1927. And on the both sides of the street, there are uh, trees planted and also some governmental and administrative buildings were started to be built alongside the street. Since 1932, Many infrastructure works have been completed in the existing traditional city fabric of Afyon and rehabilitation works 
have started in the Old Bazaar area and also in some of the major cities of the city. This one was the Old Station Boulevard and this is one another major street uh, which was important in uh, 1930s for Afyon. Thanks to its conven convenient location in terms of transportation and the fact that Ali Çetinkaya, who was the first minister of public works of the Republican period, was from Afyon, the city has become a city where the development were carried out in Ankara has been closely followed. And a uh, much more recent picture than five years later on a uh, station boulevard, we can see that most of the administrative buildings were completed the construction of them. So uh, the cinema, the party building, the courthouse, and other administrative, institutional, and military buildings were built around Station Boulevard since the 1930s. In 1933, uh, a very important law was uh, approved and implemented. And according to this law was mandatory to make a city plan within five years for every municipality in accordance. And the first development plan for the city of Afyon indeed was one year later uh, of this law. It was in 1934 prepared by Hilmi Baikal for an area of 600 hectares. And the zoning plan first divided the city into two as old and new cities. And proposed square and recreational open space arrangements in both urban areas. And the plan suggested the development of the city as it is to the east direction towards the Ali Çetinkaya train station and recreational area around the station. The square uh, reached by the boulevard in the city center. Here you can see uh, a picture of the square in the 2000, at the beginning of the 2000, and was arranged as a ceremony area uh, in front of the government office and the municipality and the park with three different levels and the, the victory uh, monument, the Utku monument, was placed in the square in 1934. And uh, on the opposite side of the street, uh, a recreational area and a sports facility uh, were designed by Nizamit Tindo in uh, 1938, and it was built afterwards. And here you can see the uh, main train station. And the train station as well was built uh, in 1939. Uh, here you can see an old picture of it. And it is nowadays uh, listed and conserved as, cult as yes, uh, cultural heritage. Uh, the urban site determined in the city center of Afyon includes the residential texture around the castle, uh, around the first uh, degree archaeological site where the castle located, and the boundaries of the area were determined by a conservation board in 1988, and it was expanded in 1993. Uh, the urban site area is divided into different planning subregions, as you can see here, the subregions, 
according to their qualities and conservation and development strategies to be applied accordingly. And it was approved the urban conservation plan in 1994. Uh, it is read from this plan that from the boundaries of the urban side that the uh, 20th century city layer, uh, which started the construction after 1920s and was arranged uh, with the 1934 plan, was left outside the urban site boundaries. This is the green one, the urban site boundaries. This is the old city. Uh, and this is the, let's say, implementation of the implementation area of the 1930 plan. What happened uh, after the 2000s? Uh, in 2011, a national, uh, let's say, competition uh, was opened for the Jumhuriyet, the Republican Square of Afyon. And the building that you see uh, uh, behind the Victory Museum uh, that was built as a result of a national competition in 1981 was demolished. And uh, the area uh, behind this, let's say, Victory Museum uh, was rearranged and a car park under the square was built a three-story car park, and the open area is arranged as a square uh, where you can see the pictures and the ramp that goes through the car park under the uh, square. This is a picture taken in 2018. And uh, the sports complex land, which was located at the east end of the station boulevard was assigned uh, to Toki, which is the Housing Development Administration of Turkey, and new housing units were started to be uh, constructed there. And this is a picture again during the demolition and construction of the new housing units in 2018. And so the old stadium and its facilities were demolished. So in the case of Afyon, the traditional housing and commercial fabric was taken into account when determining the boundaries of the urban site area. And the recognition of the historical value of the urban uh, fabric is a necessity for urban conservation. And the 20th century architectural heritage, uh, which is considered as a layer that needs to be protected, is not an urban area that conflicts with the previous urban layer, but an urban uh, area that should be preserved together with the texture that reflects the historical period and development of the city. And although protection-oriented planning is aimed in most of the cases of the urban uh, conservation plans, when the, urban, the boundaries of the urban site area are not drawn to cover uh, a large urban area, the implementation provisions, when they do not make any intervention proposal for the texture that starts just outside of the urban site area borders, then it has a negative effect on the whole city and it, that can, it cannot prevent the rapid change of the physical environment through destruction and new construction and cannot manage the change in urban uh, historic city centers. Thank you for listening and paying attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Zera, uh, for your presentation. Thanks a lot. Now we will continue with Ipe Iram Ipek Pishkin. Uh, she will uh, make her presentation on sustainability of historical bank buildings in the evolving city. Uh, Iram uh, is also uh, completed his uh, her bachelor's degree in architecture. And she re received a restoration master's degree from Istanbul Technical University. 
and she's also a uh, candidate, PhD candidate. And uh, she has nine years of work of experience in many uh, studies uh, in restoration and design projects of different scales. And uh, also, I would like to introduce her. Also, she is working in Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality uh, Cultural Heritage Department. Okay, let's have her on the stage. Good morning to all. Uh, firstly, thank you for giving me the chance to be at the symposium and for your introduction, introduction of course. I'm sharing my presentation. And I'm starting. Yes. Now, we will first examine the sustainability in a theoretical framework and point out the importance of reuse potential of the historical bank buildings that became vacant uh, due to the evolution in the city in various ways. Then we will discuss the conservation of the historic bank buildings through adaptive reuse by considering authenticity values that must be conserved by inspecting local and foraging examples. At first, there was just space. Then with the design of the space, it was given a meaning and space became a place. Space is something abstract without any actual purpose, why place refers to how people are aware of a certain piece of space. A place can be seen as a space that has a meaning, a, a spirit. As an architectural theorist, Norbert Schulz defined architecture as art of place and emphasizes the importance of the spirit of place. Defined as the protective spirit of a place in Roman mythology, genus logi, appears in the 18th century as a frequently used expression, uh, especially for more pastoral beauties. Nowadays, in contemporary use, genus logi is used for the distinctive features of a place. It emphasizes that any design must be adapted to its context. It's the physical and cultural characteristic of the place that make up this context. The spirit of a place is also related to the spirit of the time. Zeitgeist, which means the spirit of age, common time made famous by Hegel, is a concept that appears together with the spirit of the place in the 20th and uh, 21st century manifestos. We perceive the same place differently over time because time has a meaning to that place uh, and the memory of this meaning is human. Human needs and the needs of the place change over time, transform, and the place reshapes itself according to these needs. As a result of all, uh, evaluating this, this historical heritage brings all these facts together as an organizer. In the General Conference of UNESCO 2011, it was emphasized that heritage had been shaped over generations. In the Valletta principles on the conservation of historical cities and urban areas, which are uh, also dated to the same year, the definition of the spirit of the place draws attention. When it comes to sustainability, the first thing that uh, comes to our mind is the structures that can produce their energy and meet their building system needs in a cycle. But in this study, I consider sustain sustainability as the authentic values that need to be conserved and sustained together with the sustainability of their use if possible, and if not possible, <clears throat> also sustain sustainability based on energy and material saving by reusing the historical building stock. When we look at banking facilities, uh, the Red Temple in city of Uruk in <clears throat> sorry, Mesopotamia is considered to be the first bank in history, and the price of this temple who, the, who took the trust of God behind them, actually, considered to be the first bankers. The first banking activities were carried out on banks, tables, at fairs, uh, where the origin also comes from here. Uh, and the first large bank buildings are, I'm sorry, uh, are temple-like facades to sustain the trust of the religion. Even today, bank icon is actually a temple with a bank written on it. Bank buildings have been among the very important structures of their times for past to present. Historic bank buildings were often built in the focal points of the city, were flamboyant buildings that once served as landmarks. They were featured in architectural publications and postcards of the period. They are significant examples of the architecture style of their time uh, because they were commissioned directly by the state to famous architects, some of the famous architects of the bank buildings in the study, or through uh, various professional competitions 
since they were some of the most prestigious buildings within the cities. Both, they, both their architectural style and the materials used in their making, these buildings are unique cultural entities that must be conserved. Um, when we look at the banking history, banking history has played an essential role in determining banking needs. In parallel with the uh, in parallel with history as the needs changed and technology advanced, the formation of the building also changed. The equipment use has shrunk and much smaller areas have started to be sufficient for banking activities. Also with the changing methods of uh, modern banking, the enormous structures have been vacant as they no longer, no longer serve the needs of these banking methods. Moreover, the relocation of financial districts to new areas due to the urban transformation necessities, the adaptive reuse of the historic bank uh, structures. In the 19th century, with the movement of westernization, as you know, while some of the existing building types adapted to the needs of the period, new building forms and planships were born with the emerge of new functions that were not needed until then. As a product of this urban renewal, a large number of bank buildings have taken their place in major cities. Therefore, the capital city of the period, Istanbul, uh, was not only a commercial center, but also become an important financial center. Uh, while the focus of trade and money in the 18th century uh, was the historical Peninsula and Eminönü region, we see the bank structures that came with this city evolution in the 19th century uh, in the Galata region together with Eminönü. Uh, Galata uh, is not only the commercial center of Istanbul, it has also turned into a banking and financial center back then. Thus, a banking and finance access holding the two hats of the bridge is formed. Although the balances have changed a little with the loss of Istanbul capital character with the Republic, it seems that other regions in the city have gradually become the banking and financial centers of the city. Banks moved to Kapatash Fundukli regions and relatively Kadıköy and then gathered in the Levant Maslak area and created today's finance and banking center of Istanbul. Similar to the westernization in the 19th century, uh, Istanbul going through yet another urban renewal now in the 21st century. With these new changes, the innovative banking sector that wants to identify with the contemporary side of the city has withdrawn from the historical regions and structures. It's possible to follow the evolution of the city through the location changes of the financial centers and assets of vacant history bank build buildings. You can see the buildings on the bank street in Galata, even the street's name came from banks, most of uh, which date back to 19th century. Uh, while the ones uh, marked, okay, while the ones marked uh, were originally bank, bank structures, and today only one building uh, function as a central bank left. Other buildings are either empty or turned into hotels, culturally used with the changing identity of the region. Actually, we will see a few of them as examples later. Uh, in addition, with the developing technology, uh, today's banks have turned into compact units settled in small spaces. Like I said, much smaller areas have started to be sufficient for banking activities. Moreover, uh, with the evolution of online banking, digitalization of money, especially with the COVID-19, as you know, it's no longer uh, necessary for the bank function to even have a structure. In this case, banking institutions prefer to retain only a few historical buildings, which have an important place in the history of the bank, which present its old roots, emphasize its reliability, and generally be used as corporate headquarters centers in metropoles. Various uh, new uses are places in this huge remarkable um, bank structures also due to the attractiveness uh, of the location of these buildings abandoned by banking. By that, this building stock of cultural heritage value that emerged with the evolution in this has been subjected to reuse with the change of the identity of the region in which they are located. It's very valuable as their cultural assets, assets that need to be protected. But additionally, other points that must be uh, conserving are added for these structures, especially because they are bank structures. These authentic uh, values of the bank uh, banks constitute the intangible culture, heri culture, cultural heritage of the bank building, and it's 
separate that must be conserved together with the physical structure. If you look at the uh, authenticity values identified for banks to conserve uh, for the spirit of the place and time uh, for the sake of sustainability, these are facade features, planchims, signboards, entrance doors, entrance and customer halls, cash desk, and world rooms, of course. If you look at some of them with example, the examples, the most permanent uh, element of a bank structure is its sign. The types of bank signs vary according to the period. As an integral element of the bank facade at the end of the 19th century and beginning uh, of the 20th century, it's either painted on the facade or as an inscription. By the 20s, metal signs are seen on the facade as individual letters in the 40s. In the 50s, there are illuminated neon signs. If we imagine bank structures as a giant cash vault, the entrance doors are almost like walled uh, gates, doors as symbol of trust and power. Again, they are especially shaped uh, according to their period and for this. One of the most important pieces of equipment of the bank structure is the vault rooms. This is uh, the Ottoman bank in Eminönü. The, the vault rooms in the basement floors, uh, as you see why some of the rooms are on display here, but uh, some are vacant. The counters and halls where the customer is welcomed are again characteristic places of the bank structures. Uh, customer hall is an area surrounded by counters and generally illuminated by the skylight window uh, on the ceiling. The importance of its location is also evident in the planching. This example is Ishbank structure opened in the 40s on the Istanbul Beyoğlu uh, Istiklal Street. Nowadays, uh, when I take, uh, yes, this building, when I take uh, pictures from this exact uh, point, we see that it's vacant and uh, the elements in the entrance hall are, are still there. Uh, care must be taken when considering uh, functioning. Uh, many different definitions define this concept, uh, but they all come to the same point, uh, actually. The most uh, effective way to conserve a heritage building is to use it. Cultural assets, historical buildings may lose their original functions uh, due to the change in social life and economic structure, uh, developments in technology, uh, the urban environment, etc. Uh, refunctioning uh, ensures uh, conservation of historical buildings, uh, prevents waste of energy and resources, and contributes to sustainable development. Due to the reason I have uh, mentioned before, bank structures that necessarily remain uh, dysfunctional are being uh, reused. So finally, we will look at different local fraudulent refunctioning examples. The museum function, which is in the reusing of many cultural assets as bank, uh, banks, is a preferable use, especially as it exhibits itself and has a concept of banking or fi finance. Monjeri's Zirat Bank has designed and built in uh, 1929 in Ankara, uh, Turkey's first banking museum since uh, 1981. Uh, thus, the structure uh, exhibits itself. Uh, a similar example is the Central Bank building in Albania, uh, reused uh, as a numismatic museum. There are also museums uh, uses that uh, exhibit others, the concepts of which is other than banking. For example, this bank structure is reused as the Barter Museum, and this bank in Balkasir as the Mon Manuscript Museum. Uh, the bank in Ankara designed by Hosmeister is the uh, Stamp Museum, as we say. And cultural function is one of the functions we see in bank structures. Uh, Valerie is the architect of the twin buildings belonging to the Ottoman Bank and Central Bank. And the construction was completed in 1892 in Banks Street, uh, Galata. Today it's used as a cultural center. We see that the entrance door, signboard, cash desk, and customer hall area are uh, conserved. 
The Bank of Athens located on the same bank street and also used by the Dutch uh, Orient Bank in history is the Sabancı University Research Center now. And uh, hotel and accommodation function is a type of reuse that we often encounter in bank structures with a regional identity change. Uh, this bank structure that uh, refunction as a hotel is also on Bank Street. Uh, it has been used uh, as a hotel for six years. Uh, we see the badges and rosettas maybe uh, from the bank above the entrance and lobby doors. Uh, rooms and the bathrooms are placed on floors. There is even a gym where uh, there used to be uh, vault rooms. Unfortunately, there is no clue about it. Uh, the clue about the vault room appears in the restaurant and uh, bar section with the name. Uh, and also we see the, the original sign of the bank on the facade uh, entrance door. The other uh, neighbor bank structure in Galata has been reused as a hotel for three years. Uh, and this is restaurant area and the rooms with brick structural details, the walled uh, boxes in the reception uh, and the walled room door in the lobby are seen as interior arch architectural details. The Union Trust building built in uh, 1893 and designed by Sullivan, uh, reusing as a hotel too. Uh, we can see that the custom hall is reused as a lobby. There are also few examples of bank structures that have been used as educational functions. The Ottoman bank designed by Fossetti uh, in an important location in Salanki is today a conservatory. One of the bank structures that have been used as an office at business center is the bank structure designed by uh, Monjeri in Karaköy, Istanbul. Today, the building includes the uh, bank headquarters and private offices. Uh, and this is the bank building in Indiana, built in the 1920s and reused as an architectural architecture office. Finally, I will talk about some, some exceptional examples. Apart from Istanbul, it's possible to see uh, radical reuses such as housing in small cities in Anatolia in banks uh, built on a small scale. This is a bank building reused as a house. Uh, the sign of the bank is still on the facade of the building and the employees of old bank. Uh, National Bank building in Pennsylvania, Pen Pen oh, Pennsylvania, oh, Pennsylvania sorry, has turned into a center with a cinema. And the bank building in Minnesota dated on 1910 is reused as a restaurant with its signboards and vault doors. In Belfast, uh, Ireland, uh, the restoration of bank structures started with the uh, sp sponsorship uh, of Primark and some of them are used as large Primark stores. Uh, I will send the link uh, of the restoration process uh, to those who are interested from the chat. Yes, as a result with the uh, evolution of the city and the relocation of banking in the city, the historical bank buildings which have a significant place in the city history became vacant. And changing the identity uh, of the region in which they are located may cause uh, bank structures to lose their identity, their separate. It's important that the historical bank structures uh, reflected the characteristic of their period. Mostly they were built by famous architects and that they are at focal points in the cities. They are landmarks, but Beyond that, because they are bank buildings, uh, they have authentic values that must be conserving and it's essential to sustain uh, those values in this sustainability. In other words, it's very uh, important to maintain the character of the building, the spirit of the place, as well as the spirit of the structure original function. I'm saying that a new function of the type that it can continue to host all of this is acceptable in reusing form banks if it's necessary. Based on the authenticity values uh, determined for bank structures, a new function, uh, function that considers these values and conserved to be acceptable only. If these values, which protect the uh, spirit and intangible uh, of its original function, uh, are conserved together with the physical structure, they can 
only be passed on the future generations by conserving with a holistic approach. Thank you for your listening. Okay, thank you for Iram Ipek Pishkin uh, for uh, their presentation with her professor Yegan Kahya Sayar. Uh, the paper titled Sustainability of Historical Bank Buildings in the Evolving City. We will have also your questions uh, if there are some comments or questions and at, at the end of this section. Now we will hear, uh, we will uh, have uh, Saba Ina. He's an, she's an architect urban researcher and she holds a Bachelor of Architecture Engineering from Jordan University of Science and Technology. And she also uh, has a practice, including working on the reconstruction of a Palest uh, Palestinian refugee camp in North Lebanon, which was a project nominated for Ahan Award in architecture in, in 2013. So let's save Saba for her presentation. Good morning. And um, thank you for having me here. Uh, I will share my screen. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, how can I? I'm sorry, I'm struggling with this. Uh, just press F5. It will also oh, yeah. oh, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, no, it, does, it did not work. Um, it did not work. Just a second. Uh, is there another way? Uh, from view. Um, I can't. I can't get to it for some reason. I don't know why. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So, um, reading the modern narrative of Amman between the nation and the national. So um, the work uh, uh, is, is a proposition um, for the deconstruction of the modern narrative of Amman um, through official architectural gestures and their implication in the national identity. So the capital of Amman, uh, the modern state of Jordan, uh, the capital of modern state of Jordan was subjected to over 50 plans between uh, urban planning, I mean, attempts between the 1950s and the 80s. However, it was uh, not until the 1980s uh, that the signifiers of the modern state um, started to become evident in, in uh, the cityscape. Um, and by that, I mean the master plan, the monument, and the plaza. So uh, the symptoms of if we may say symptoms of belated modernity uh, cannot be read outside um, the ways that a man was experiencing successive separations from, uh, from Palestine, uh, starting from the annexation of the West Bank in 1950 uh, uh, to, to, to Nexa, the setback, the second exodus of Palestinian in 1967, to the disengagement of the West Bank from Jordan in 1987. So those separations um, varied in their intensities, uh, but, will, uh, but were all inscribed in, in, in uh, the cityscape. Um, in the official discourse, a, a new phase of Amman as a modern city, but in a postmodern time, was announced during the late 70s, early 80s, introducing a new kind of monumentality. And um, the work builds um, around two official um, ceremonial events. Uh, and their architectural gestures in superimposition uh, with scenes that are built around walks, uh, mapping, spatial analysis, and so on. So the first scene uh, is the Hashemite Plaza or Sahel Hashemiya, winter 2002. Uh, this is uh, this is the Hashemite Plaza. So uh, standing in um, standing in the plaza, one um, 
faces the citadel, uh, a palimpsest of ancient ruins and uh, uh, the palace's mountains, uh, uh, where, where the first royal palaces were built uh, in, in the 1920s. And the Roman amphitheater to the left and to the right is the Ragadan uh, bus terminal, which links downtown to other areas and adjacent uh, uh, cities, uh, nearby cities. So uh, what we see here um, is uh, basically um, uh, three three public spaces aligned on one axis, but each representing a different uh, public. As part of Amman Downtown Tourist Zone, uh, a project funded by JICA, the Japanese uh, International Cooperation Agency, uh, and governed by the municipality uh, of Greater Amman, the Ghadan Bus Terminal, um, has been temporarily relocated to the city's uh, uh, eastern uh, end, al uh, which means station in Arabic. Uh, the, project, uh, the project aims to, to uh, promote uh, tourism um, in downtown Amman through small-scale uh, interventions like pedestrian trails linking, um, uh, linking significant historical sites or uh, by maybe upgrading uh, main streets. But the primary um, focus of this uh, redesign, uh, the focus of this project is uh, the redesign of the of, uh, Ragadan Terminal uh, as a tourist transportation hub. So we walking by the construction site by that time, uh, Sahel Hashmi seems really dysfunctional and obsolete. Uh, Al Mahatta uh, area, uh, which references basically the Hejaz rail, uh, railway station, um, um, is where the um, temporary uh, terminal is located in the middle of the highway, uh, next to um, workshops, uh, factories, um, facing also facing Mahatta refugee Palestinian refugee camp. So one one would say that this scene is actually uh, this is a scene of what what the city cast aside. It is a center that uh, was forced to become an edge. So uh, cities um, grow in accordance with shift in capital um, accumulation and patterns of consumption, generating a fully commoditized uh, form of social life through large scale developments uh, and, and the regeneration practices. But gradually the city uh, tra is transformed into an image that triggers uh, marginalization, gentrification, and of course, increasing um, uh, spatial and social segregation. So the purpose here is not to, or uh, is not to criticize these projects per se, or or the impact of gentrification and displacement. It's not that I'm not critical of that. Of course, I am, but um, I mean. Uh, that this is not uh, specific to Amman. It's it's uh, basically the, the these are the natural uh, consequences of capital accumulation everywhere. However, in Amman, uh, there is uh, one can read a purposeful political act that runs through these practices. Uh, targeted gentrification um, is a way of reclaiming place. Uh, particularly public spaces after their abandonment. So if we consider, uh, for instance, a triangle between Ragadan um, and the amphitheater on one side and on the other side, uh, the city hall, uh, uh, a newly constructed um, edge of, of downtown, and the Abdali bus terminal at the end of Salt Street. Uh, this this triangle basically, um, uh, which has come to define or confine the downtown area, uh, represents the revival uh, or reclamation of these centers by political power uh, in a way that denies other representations of the recent history of Amman. So this return is constructed through three large scale urban uh, regeneration projects that focus on the idea of heritage as a frozen uh, material image. So in, in its formative years, Amman was growing around the valley, uh, making use of the major resources uh, then, the stream of water or uh, the, the, the actually a river then that was um, drying gradually to become a stream, uh, the ruins of the Roman city, Hejaz railway, and so on and so forth. So after the declaration of, of Transjordan in 1921, Prince Abdullah turned what was already becoming uh, a city 
center, the area around the amphitheater, uh, into an institutional governmental uh, square. And in 1924, he designated the mountain overlooking the amphitheater as the location of the royal palaces, uh, the first palace, the Redan Palace. Um, 1955, Max Locke, uh, the UN town planner, uh, along with Gerald King, uh, were commissioned to develop a master plan to tackle issues of housing and infrastructure uh, in the aftermath of Nakba, the first exodus of Palestinian, uh, in, uh, Palestinians in 1948. Uh, in addition to that, he proposed a vision for Amman, a central park uh, located in the valley of downtown around the water uh, to be emptied of its fabric and transformed into green space with museums, cafes, theater, which is the same zone um, being developed by JICA mentioned before. Uh, but in reality, another fabric was developing. Two Palestinian camps, as we see here uh, in red, uh, were built in the beginning of the 50s in perpendi per perpendicular with the valley. Uh, their proximity to, to the royal palaces, I think, is astonishing. Uh, so a couple of years later, uh, to be precise, in 1957, another royal palace uh, uh, a fourth one, in fact, was built um, west of downtown in the Zahran area, uh, declaring a new center or a shift. So this, this figure is a juxtaposition between 1953 aerial photo and a map from the early 70s showing the expansion of the camps after Naksa, the second exodus of Palestinian in this image, in this imaginary circle. Uh, uh, and where lower and uh, lower middle class settled in, in the voids between the camps and the center, uh, also the royal palaces. Um, although uh, the tourism sector was severely affected after occupation of Jerusalem in 67, uh, the, uh, the capital of Amman gained um, um, uh, it was actually it was uh, it was a capital gain for Amman in in terms of uh, capital migration. I mean, uh, so upper middle class of the West Bank settled towards the northwest axis of of the city or spine of the city, creating another fabric. So imagine if as if we're slicing. Uh, um, uh, slicing this imaginary circle, uh, uh, indicating the new um, expansion. So we would think that uh, what is unwanted uh, in, in the city is usually pushed um, to the edges. In this case, uh, in this case, we could imagine that uh, the city is abandoning itself uh, in phases gradually uh, towards the exits. Um, so in 1967, um, 1967 marked um, a, a turning point for Palestinians. It was the moment uh, uh, where, when Palestinians, especially in the camps, started to take um, to take their matters in their own hands, basically, and I mean through the armed struggle uh, and Palestinian freedom fighters uh, who found um, their zone of influence in the community beyond and outside the camps. So clashes uh, and confrontation between the army, the Jordanian army and the Palestinian freedom fighters, Fida'iyin, were aggravating, leading to September 97, uh, when King Hussein finally ordered his troops to strike and eliminate the Fida'in network in, in Jordan. So um, uh, this, what, which came to be known as uh, Black September. So after um, the Palestinian resistance left Amman uh, and Jordan entirely in 1971, the political void was filled uh, by the rise of the Hashemite throne as the sole political representative of Palestinians. Uh, in Jordan. So, and this uh, takes us to ceremony number one, Sahel uh, Hashemiyeh or Hashemite Plaza 1986. 
So in November 1986, the Hashemite Plaza was unveiled as a birthday gift to King Hussein. Uh, it was the first plaza to be built as a political one. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, overlooking it are the royal palaces. So, so it, it made it a perfect spot for uh, military shows and marches. Um, and somehow it replicates the, the relation between the Agora, just next to it, the citadel, uh, sorry, the temple uh, and the Agora, uh, the Roman amphitheater. So uh, uh, um, at, at its corner, the renovated Roman amphitheater uh, um, uh, host, uh, which hosts a small, um, uh, a small museum of tradition um, and uh, the traditional crafts and objects. And the plaza seems to take the, the uh, shape of the amphitheater, the semicircular shape. Uh, and I think, um, I think this interplay um, is a conscious gesture to, to the ancient past and notably the first time such a dialogue with history has appeared uh, in official discourse, the reference to uh, Greco-Roman. Uh, uh, another importance uh, for this plaza that it has marked uh, the, 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 the um, uh, complete or the final uh, disappearance of the stream of water in downtown. So a cell uh, uh, was disappearing basically or, or drying in phases, but also uh, uh, due to uh, sudden growth and the lack of planning and uh, the need to relieve traffic, the stream was fully covered and uh, became a street named the roof, literally the roof of this uh, of the stream. Uh, and the stream was replaced with a uh, with a water fountain in in, uh, uh, in Sahel Hashmi, which actually was replaced later and uh, uh, after one year with a, with a clock tower. Um, so. Uh, so what? So I mean, this is um, this leads me to a takes me to a question, uh, a genuine one. And what becomes of a place when uh, when uh, an element of its formative years uh, vanishes? So an entire street was uh, was. Uh, an entire street level was buried and the new floor was built uh, and the street long arcade, uh, uh, monotonous arcade was erected at once uh, and a new sense of time, a new sense of uh, space uh, was created through a new plane of motion. Um, and then ceremony number two, the Martyrs Memorial 1977. So in the aftermath of Black September, there was an urgent need for the Jordanian state to rewrite its narrative. Uh, one response was a method of erasure, for example, uh, the destruction of the tomb of the unknown martyr uh, in 1971, which the Palestinian Liberation Organization erected in Jabal Ashrafiya just before, uh, just after Black September. Another response was the monumentality, a new mon monumentality that was imposed on the city uh, that one could say widened the schism between um, uh, the domestic and the urban, but also the the uh, the east and west. I mean, there is no actual clear schism. It, it's it's far more complicated than that. But at that moment, it was very uh, uh, it was a very clear line. Um, uh, for example, the National uh, Assembly, the Ministry of Defense, the Secret Police Building, the King Abdullah uh, first the first mosque uh, were all built on one axis between the old city uh, and the new city. Um, but there is one particular uh, uh, moment that this, this monumentality was being formulated, which is, the, uh, when, which, uh, which is in 1977 uh, and during the uh, celebration, uh, ce celebrations of um, celebrations and the occasion of uh, the Silver Jubilee of King Hussein, um, a very clear monumentality was, was being launched and celebrated, be it uh, celebrations in public spaces, but also in an inauguration of, uh, of commercial and public buildings that are not really institutional or governmental buildings, such as banks. For example, the, a major housing bank that became uh, a major icon uh, to this, uh, to that time, uh, to that time, or to the architecture from that time, which was competing actually with the Roman uh, amphitheater and postcards even. Um, but 
The most important monument was uh, the Martyrs uh, uh, Memorial, uh, which unveiled in the uh, anniversary uh, of the Arab Revolt and independence uh, of, of Jordan. Uh, and um, um, it's interesting that the, the Jordan's independence was not really connected to any um, heroic battle. So there's nothing really to rally a national psyche around. There's no actual hero or monotonous days, you know. So, but at that time, it was crucial to create one. Um, it, this this monument was Sorry, uh, uh, just to just to remind that there's two minutes left. Oh my God! Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, um, it was designed by Victor Pcharat uh, with the help of uh, the armed forces. And uh, the memorial drew um, uh, draws on two visual references, Al Kaaba and Acropolis, and also it uh, it uh, it emphasizes two pillars of the national narrative: religion and military. Um, uh, so. It, it, this memorial is another piece uh, of, of constructed evidence of the unspoken and um, uh, and uh, what is avoided in, in, in the Jordanian narrative. Um, scene number two, the final scene of, of, uh, of the presentation, which is Ragadan and Al Abdali uh, bus terminal in 2015. So, um, uh, Ragadan bus terminal and Hashemite Plaza were given um, a makeover, but still the, the, the bus terminal was is and uh, out of function till today. Uh, so users of old Ragadan and uh, the old Abdali bus terminal um, will continue to be spatially excluded and pushed further away from the center to Al Mahatta, where where uh, where Ragadan bus terminal was relocated, but also. Abdali bus terminal uh, was located to, to uh, Tabarbur, uh, another edge of the city. So while Amman working class um, uh, are made to travel the perimeter of the city, the center uh, is opened up as a site for meandering tourists. The Abdali regeneration project, which was previously um, a site for the General Jordan Armed Forces headquarters overlooking the Abdali bus terminal before its location to Tabarbur, uh, is a new development with over 1.7 million square meters of apartments, re um, retail, uh, offices, you know, the perfect uh, new city kind of uh, regeneration project. Uh, its towers and new architectural language suggest a new mon monumentality in harmony with an existing one. So the National Assembly, the Supreme Court, and Abdullah, uh, Abdullah the first mosque, uh, it is a, a, a real, um, I, need, I need one minute, I'm sorry, a real estate project that is embraced by governmental monumentality. So, and the boundary becomes really elusive. So, uh, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end with uh, with two slides. So in a city that is um, um, that is constructing uh, itself in a framework of nation building as a whole, every ruler has come with a new palace location, a mosque uh, named after the late king, and so on. And the most recent uh, shift, so the seat of power relocated to the far west of the city, Hummar, effectively turning its back to uh, to the whole uh, city. Its location defines by, by uh, defines the class caliber of the residents. So I'm ending by this quote. Uh, Town literally could not be seen from dust, dust from stone crushing machines and cement mixers, dust from the pillars of sand and mortar dumped everywhere, uh, uh, dust from the stone cutters cutting and chipping the local building stone nonstop for 13 or 14 hours a day. Hacker and Clark, 1960, Modern Amman, a social study. In the framework of their field research conducted in 1957, Hacker and Clark describe a scene that seems so familiar, almost timeless. So in this non in your timeline I tried to, con uh, to construct, there is a record of a process of trial and error or of erasure whereby the state in the process of reclamation seems to be constantly building a ruin that soon will be abandoned and replaced by another in an, other endless, in an endless process of building the national. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for uh, Sabah Inna for her interesting presentation about Amman and its environment. So we will have now uh, Fran Fran Francisco Macini and uh, Tanya Gulusak. 
I think uh, Francesca uh, Macini is going to present, uh, and uh, he is uh, associate professor at Kutin University and deputy or head of the School of Design and Built Environment of that university. And he is taught at the University of Rome, Tre, and he's an architect and terrorist interested in sustainable design, urban morphology, building typology, and critical design thinking. And he also taught with the uh, international scholar and architect Peter Eisman in the uh, Cooper Union School of Architecture in New York. And he has a PhD from University of Florence. So let's have uh, uh, Francesca uh, to make her presentation uh, with Tanya Glusak. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, I need to share my screen. Um, so if- The other- the yeah, the participant, share. if he can, if she can stop sharing. Um, yep, I stopped sharing. Perfect. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yes. Uh, okay. I'm getting there. Yeah. Can you see it, everyone? We can see it. You can make it full screen if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see full screen now? Uh, we yeah. see it in the presentation mode now. Oh, you see the presentation yeah. mode. So okay. So that's fine. Yeah. No, they, they see the presentation mode. So I need to swap. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, will we go this way? No problem. It, no? You still see the presentation yeah, mode. Exactly. You can end, end the presentation. Okay. And. Uh, Okay. Okay. Let's um, start, maybe. Please open the presentation mode again. Uh, okay. Let's see if, does it work this way? Yes, it works. Yes. It works? Okay, okay. perfect. Yes. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome from the very pleasant Perth in the autumn. Um, Today we're talk, going to talk about um, a research that we've been working on for quite some time in relation to heritage in Perth, or the treatment of heritage in Perth, um, in a paper that we have titled Fragment, Field and Frame. Now, heritage sites as extended portions of territory subject to preservations are very often defined as precincts with clear boundaries in particular when refer to urban areas, centers of European cities that most of you will be familiar with, like Rome, Paris, and London, for instance, uh, all still have their historic nuclei, which are essential to the recognition of their city's identity. But what happens when the strong historic nucleus is missing and isolated buildings scattered across the urban landscapes are supersede, um, supposedly entrusted with the role of uh, perpetuating a city's heritage and associated identity, as happens to be the case of Perth WA, Western Australia. So in this presentation, we effectively argue that to date heritage has not conceived of itself as a frame, which includes fragments that can be recombined in the urban field in coexistence with the city's contemporary and former past. So I'll pass it to um, Francesco now to kind of showcase to you some of the sides of Perth and its treatment of heritage. Thanks, Tania. Um, so as Tania introduced, we're focusing on heritage in, in relationship to the ability of uh, persisting buildings to shape cities and, and maintain unity and identity of cities today. And the case of Perth is quite interesting because Perth is a recent settlement was founded in 1829 and of course uh, it's a modernist city uh, that presents this very cohesive uh, front uh, at, the, at the visitors but effectively uh, has a, uh, many, many issues to deal with the continuity of the city exactly because of the model of development which didn't take into account also the continuation or the continuity uh, with its past and for a number of reasons. Uh, part of these reasons uh, are in the way the, um, the, the chart of preservation uh, is being uh, prepared in, in, in Australia is the Bureau Charter uh, that is a bit different from the Venice Charter and we hope through this presentation to start highlighting some of the differences that actually led to particular results in the city of Perth. 
Um, just a little bit of a historic or a geographic overview where Perth is located in Western Australia is along the Swan River uh, <clears throat> on Wajak Nunga land, uh, uh, previously occupied by the Wajak, uh, Wajak people in this region uh, in, uh, in the state of Western Australia. And uh, the original settlements were actually um, located in Fremantle, that was the port, and then uh, going up to the river, uh, the center of uh, Perth was established in 1829, as we said, and then the city of Guildford, <coughs> which was more in the inner part of the city. These are the core uh, uh, elements, uh, settlements of, in the region that actually are the most historically loaded uh, with some form of heritage. These are the <coughs> plans of Perth when it was settled in 1833. This is the first survey. And you can see is a grist skin, very typical of, um, of colonial settings with two major ro uh, um, squares. Uh, the grid is quite big. The, 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 the Greek plot is uh, 220 by 80 meters in, in, in length. So it, it's even bigger than Manhattan's uh, square, uh, grid, just, for give you, just to give you an idea. Um, and the two major churches were located where you see the red spot and the blue spot. So the, um, the Samaria Cathedral versus the St. George Cathedral, so the two major cathedral were placed for the um, Catholic and Protestant um, um, rites, a, 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 exactly at the very center of the city. One of these will become effectively the, the city center where most of the heritage that still preserves today exists as a cohesive precinct, and we will get to, to that um, a bit further in this uh, presentation. So um, the, the city of Perth in, in, in 1950s still looked like the images that you see on your, on your right. This is St. George Terrace, one of the major streets of the city. Uh, still today, very active center uh, of business and activities. But uh, what changes uh, in, in 1950s is that essentially <clears throat> after the Second World War, a modernist approach that was bringing the notion of city center as a business center um, really um, took uh, over the uh, expression of, uh, uh, of a, a city as a creative unity. Um, many of the buildings were expressing colonial power at the time of 1950. This was uh, partially substituted by big companies which um, uh, built new buildings that were needed. Uh, Perth is also called Boomtown because uh, it went through three major mining booms. Uh, one in 1890, one in 1960, and one in the year 2000, that effectively boosted the economy of the city and caused a very strong disruption in the way the city itself um, developed. <clears throat> and this is how the city uh, looks like today. Um, so the, the, uh, the grid is being fully saturated and in this area here on the left side next to the convention center, is where the major buildings, the, um, the, the skyscrapers of the tall buildings are taking place. As you can see from the small image down left, this is the city plan from 1955, the city planning scheme, uh, where the, the infrastructure is actually bounding the city and uh, it is imagining a particular business city that is working from nine to five, where the, the activity and the life is conceived as a productivity. Uh, in, on top of that, the emphasis on infrastructure rather than uh, on building fabric has led to a particular development where this was a city for cars um, in, in line with what we will describe as the modern, a, a furthest and post furthest development. But what happened with heritage? Uh, if you look back at the territory of the region of the Perth, this is about one third of the urban region of Perth at the moment. A period extends for 135 kilometers, really sprawled city. Um, you can see that the heritage location that is accurately mapped in terms of areas of interest for heritage, the dark red is the state register. The, uh, the, the, the light uh, pink is actually a local city heritage or uh, assessment program in place. Tells us that there is an interest for areas and a certain level of interest for buildings. In Australia, there is a third level of heritage listing, which is the national heritage. There's not a national heritage listing except for very few buildings in the region of Perth. 
Um, but most importantly, the way um, um, heritage is conceived through the Bureau Charter pays attention to the particular element that has a particular significance and value and it helps with the interpretation of these buildings, but doesn't focus on the system as a whole. In other words, the notion of urban historic centers has never been conceived uh, as a potential value in itself. And this is why also, as you can see from the image on your left, most of the buildings have been effectively replaced in less than 30, 40 years between 1950 and 1990 in the very city center of the city. Same happened uh, scattered also in Fremantle and to a less extent in Guildford, which is the most preserved of the three uh, original colonial uh, settings. Um, there is another layer of discussion which we will not approach in this presentation in this paper, which is very important in Australia, and that is the um, preservation and, and, and the heritage of the Aboriginal culture. So there is a particular Aboriginal act which takes place at that. There's been a long discourse about uh, acknowledging and reconciliating these two types of heritages. Today we focus on the on colonial heritage and the urban settings. Uh, and this is how heritage is preserved uh, in the city. So apart from few uh, buildings that actually uh, recall the memory of the neo-Gothic and neoclassical city that was um, the replica of uh, European cities um, in Europe, uh, most of the uh, heritage is actually preserving facades or parts of buildings that were deemed to have particular significance, but the the integration with the new and, and, and in particular, the, the, the maintenance of the unity of the building, um, according to Cesar Brandi's idea of restoration as a moment of recognition of the work of art. And by definition, in work of art, we need to identify um, a sort of wholeness in the piece of work we are looking at. This was completely um, dismissed or not considered in the Bureau Charter, which in this, in this sense is very much different from the Venice Charter. Um, and they set, set aside, I think, apart, uh, 15 years apart, uh, so from 1964 to 1975. And this is also part of the, the reason why the Bureau Charter is, is, is developed in, in a very different <clears throat> context. What happened to the cities in general, and uh, this is another element of reflection uh, in our discourse, is that the city center has lost in a, being transformed in the, in, in, in the business center, uh, has lost its capacity to perform as nucleus that is um, maintaining or, or preserving the identity of the whole city. Um, this is another issue for very large cities uh, they, who, which expanded beyond the core and became more of a urban regions. Um, they did not embed many other um, original centers. They just sprawled in gentrified areas, <clears throat> pushing uh, to the fringe a number of activities, including, including industrial suburbs, but also living suburbs. Um, so this is a double phenomenon. On the one hand is the huge expansion of cities, uh, which reducing the power and scale of the city center to act uh, as an element of recognition. Uh, and the, in the other element is that uh, moving to, towards the city that is automobile based, so the fourth is city, um, clearly uh, reliance on symbols of power communication and, and presence uh, through buildings has been somehow put in, in, in the background. And you can understand uh, how, what that means if you look at what, what the city fair looks like um, today <coughs> in, this, uh, in this particular image. Um, back to the city center, the way heritage has been dealt with an approach uh, is uh, substantially what well, we define the recognition of a fragment, but a, the definition of <clears throat> a, a fragment that doesn't uh, constitute a system, doesn't sit in the field and doesn't frame the unity of the city. So even the most advanced, uh, advanced or bold examples of restoration or completion, this is actually more of a completion of the uh, St. Mary Cathedral, actually tend to isolate buildings in the precinct um, <clears throat> and, and isolate them from, uh, from the urban life. And therefore they have limited ability to actually act as landmarks other than their visual presence um, in terms of being really recognized and used uh, as, as places, uh, public places 
A, a very um, symptomatic example is also the demolition of the barracks, the pier barracks, the barracks where the army used to stay during colonial times and was left just the entry that became a sort of triumphal arch that has been lined up with a new building of the parliament that has been located here uh, on, the, on the west side. And the reason for that is that the demolition of the barracks actually made space to the huge uh, freeway that is connecting north to south. So the infrastructure really led over the, the, the preservation of some sort of identity and anchor point uh, to the city of the past. Uh, what is left is the ability from one particular point of view, this is along um, St. George Terrace, to identify the entry as, a, as the simulacrum of the entrance to the, uh, to the Parliament House. But um, these approaches to heritage, we found that from, particularly from an urban perspective, but also in terms of preservation of value and, and, and uh, possibility to understand uh, what the original buildings um, meant um, actually is not very successful and needs to be rethought uh, in, in some form. Um, this is another case uh, where the, the fragment in this case is the pedestrian bridge, the horse, horse shore bridge, which was uh, leading, um, sorry, what's happening to this? Um, the, the Horseshoe Bridge was uh, effectively um, connecting to the uh, train station, which is still uh, located in this place here. Um, but when the, the, the piazza was uh, the, the square, that is the Agon Square, renamed after a, a Nunga chief um, in recognition of the presence of the Aboriginal people, has been redeveloped. Effectively, a, 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 this turned out to be sort of a missed opportunity because um, the bold project that tries to combine so many narratives uh, from the geology of the place to the nature of the place and the presence of Aboriginal people here does not engage really uh, with, the, um, uh, with the bridge itself, leaving a gap um, in, in terms of also physical and, and I would say intangible reconciliation. So our main critique to the way uh, heritage is approached uh, in Western Australia is that there's, there is a sort of a silo component where it is not possible to easily recombine the material heritage with the material heritage through a integration of ancient and new form. There are some exceptions with might be criticized in terms of um, outcomes, but in this case, for instance, the this is the very city center where the second cathedral is located, um, the cathedral of, 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 some, of St. George Terrace, um, sorry, I said St. Patrick before, uh, where the original nucleus has been integrated, as you can see here on the second of the yellow diagrams, has been integrated with new buildings which accommodate the new state library, um, the, the church building and uh, the, um, the state tribunal building, which is this uh, bowl tower that is, has been inserted into the, uh, into the, um, the courtyard. Uh, but in a way, this is a successful operation because it has been able to integrate or at least negotiate the, not only the position, but also the relationship between the former town hall, um, the government offices today, uh, a, the treasury building, um, a, which is a, a, a big hotel, the, the state, um, the presence of the state tribunal, which is an institution, the main cathedral, um, the, the, the building that is next to it. So a number of functions, powers, if you like, or institutions who exist together. And for us, this would be probably one of the best examples of integration of heritage in an urban discourse. Um, another proposition that didn't take place yet, but has been proposed a few years ago, is to liberate, to set free the, the gardens of the of the government house district, which at the moment has beautiful garden. They, they are supposed to be public spaces, but they're not really used by, by the community uh, by integrating uh, them in, a, in an urban street. Uh, and this has been proposed as the Pier Street st uh, study um, in 2011. Now, it it's maybe doesn't look too much clear here in this image, but if you actually compare the mapping of the heritage place, you will see that this has not been fully taken into account. So uh, again, there is an intuition, we might say, but probably a very careful study 
on what can be preserved and what would be an anchor point to integrate, to frame in, in, in a cohesive field, uh, the presence of the ancient and the new should be, from our perspective, um, the, the next level. Too often we, we see that uh, only facades or corners of the buildings are preserved. Mm, the, the integration between the aesthetic value, the artistic value, if you like, according to Brandy's perspective, and the notion of use, which is the other big pillar of preservation, continuity of use or reuse, uh, sometimes miss, uh, misses in, in, the, in the level of thinking and in the design approach. One example that is actually quite successful in this regard is the reuse of the asylum at Hitchcock Reserve, uh, Reserve that is located here, south of Perth, uh, along, the, along the river. And this precinct has been rehabilitated in, and reused for a, as, a, as, a public, as a public park with a number of venues, a gallery, a museum, a shop, uh, and restaurants here, uh, where families in, in, in community can gather all together and this is a very, very good example of how the building has been brought back to the community. Um, in this case, there are no really new buildings, just preservation of the old ones. Um, we're not saying that this is the way, but definitely is, um, is a good outcome exactly. overall. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to just spend 30 seconds on, on what we believe is the, 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 the framework that is underpinning our thinking, and essentially is the theory of Aldo Rossi and the permanence of buildings, we believe that his uh, uh, approach through the uh, materialist uh, theory about the importance of economic factors and material factors in determining permanence of buildings is as important as the notion of tradition in typological process produced by the school of Muratori and Kanicha. We're trying to see if by combining these two, because the, the school of Muratori always struggled with the contemporary city uh, or the approach to contemporary city, we are trying to see if there is a link that can help us to recombine the city as a palimpsest, um, which is always there, even though cities are not very old, like in the case of Perth, we do believe that it's very, very important to uh, consider uh, all the layers of the city at the same time. The city of Rome is exemplar because uh, it, it, it contains layers from possibly every age since the antiquity to uh, contemporary age, and all of these are visible, integrated, transformed, and it's a superb lesson uh, from which probably we could uh, all learn in terms of in terms of approach. Um, but we have also to be mindful that we need to move away from the city of monuments that Sita was producing, and this is probably the, the best part that we like of Rossi's criticism and relying more on the psychological geography, on theory of perception. Alexander, um, Christopher Alexander has proposed this is theory of unity and wholeness of the city. We do believe that it's very, very important to consider um, the, the gap and the fragmentation that happened between the pre-industrial uh, city and the, and the new city to actually recombine these elements together at various scales is, is a big challenge, but in some cases mm -hmm. that works. Um, last but not least, the, sorry, sorry, uh, yeah. the time is almost like up. So can you just like uh, yes, the, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, yes. So okay. the other the other big element is to consider the um, the uh, the intangible heritage. This is the last example as an example of what could have been done. Uh, the Cali Spotter in Subiaco. You can see the from a pattern of the of the factory that has been completely dismissed in the new development, and there was really no reason for doing this. And so the fragments actually float. Um, in the new development without really establishing a connection with the, with the present. And with this, we actually conclude our presentation. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for your presentation, uh, Francesco Mancini and Tanya Gluzak. Uh, it was a very interesting pre uh, presentation. Now we will have uh, questions. I cannot find. Uh, will you please help me, Pelin? Uh, if there are mm -hmm. some questions, questions uh, are there questions? Uh, yeah. Or we have you can have your comments on the chat. Or there's actually can... a question uh, from Teresa Coletta, but that's in uh, uh, Italian. So um, if someone Link. can help us out, that would be great. <laughs> translate uh, for translation. I, yes. I don't think it's a question for the audience. Uh, 
for the for the speakers. It's more like huh. a discussion. Okay. So if anyone would like to comment, I see Per, just uh, raise your hand, turn on your microphone, camera, come up. Per. Thank you. Um, I have a sort of general observation. We are trying uh, in the CCP to find ways to create dialogues between different disciplines, between the academic and actual practice. Uh, and one of the things that, that uh, strike me always is that on one hand, we have a sort of uh, <clears throat> perhaps often academic way of thinking, which starts from the analysis of the situation uh, in which we do not have a sort of practical solution as the first uh, goal, but rather uh, to analyze what is actually going on. Mm -hmm. uh, on one hand, we have that sort of, of, of work. On the other hand, we have another approach which is related to, to direct practice and which is mainly oriented at finding an immediate solution to a particular problem. And if we look at different papers, we see at some all presentations wish to, to do something of both, but some tends to end up in one end and others in another end. And I think we should be aware of that when we look at the content of different presentations in order to uh, be able to produce uh, uh, an interesting dialogue. Um, often, or when we are practitioners, we have to use certain concepts that are very popular within a given structure of practice, uh, political, administrative concepts, um, while in an analytical uh, perspective, that could be a problem. Uh, of course, we, we must then... Uh, try to respect these two traditions and try to find ways to, to create bridges between them in a way. Uh, and I, I just want everybody